actually the title of the thoughts that I want to share with you this evening. It's a question. Is God good to you? Is God good to you? You know, there's some famous atheists, one of which is Christopher Hitchens. He was a famous atheist. He no longer is because he's not on this earth anymore. I've, I've said before, and I've heard it said, I don't think there's any atheists even in hell. I think they have that figured out by now. But anyway, Hitchens, before he died, he wrote a book, God is Not Great. And in that book, he argued that religion was just a man-made wish that distorts people's lives. Another famous atheist, Richard Dawkins, he wrote a book called The God Delusion. And in that book, he argues that uh, ultimately human beings have to free themselves from the self-imposed shackles of uh, religion and that religion and faith have to be destroyed and positivity has to be embraced so that the human species can reach their full potential. Well, I think the reason that some either reject God's goodness or even God's existence, as these men do, is because they observed some measure of injustice, either in their lives or in the lives of other people, or in the world in general. And that has turned them against God. And uh, they at least have said that God isn't good, or that God isn't great, or that God doesn't even exist. Well, I want to share with you just some thoughts briefly this evening. And I want to begin with this thought about a good Lord and then I want to talk about a good life. Good Lord and the good life. All right, let's go ahead and pray first. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can bow before you tonight because we know that we believe that you are and that you are a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. Lord, we can attest to that. And we can thank you tonight for that. We pray that you would just Minister to our hearts the truth that you want us to meditate on and to remember as we gather here tonight in your name. Meet the spiritual needs in people's hearts. Some may be atheists. Some may be agnostics. Some may be uh, simply embittered and blaming you for whatever circumstances they find themselves in or they've passed through, some injustice that they see. Lord, we pray that you would just minister to the hearts of people tonight as we consider your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I've had you turn to Psalm 73 for a purpose. Notice how the psalm begins. I believe that Psalm 73, the first verse, is actually the conclusion that the psalmist Asif came to. It's not his experience. It's what came out of his experience. He was a very bitter man. He was blaming God. He was blaming God for the injustices that he saw in human life. But God straightened him out. And we'll see how God straightened him out. But the conclusion of the matter really is the first verse. It's interesting how it, it works out. In this scripture, finally the psalmist came to the proper conclusion. Have you come to this conclusion, by the way, as you sit here tonight? Are you with me? Is this the conclusion you came to? It says, truly God is good. Have you come to rest there? Have you come to believe that? Is that really um, a description of where you're at tonight? Can you honestly say, as you sit here in your heart, or as you listen, truly, God is good? You know, we talk about the good life. We talk about goodness. 
And the fact of the matter is that goodness or the good life is summed up in a person. And that person has invited you to live with him in unbroken fellowship. You know what evil is? You know what sin is? Maybe you have a list of what you would call sin. Well, let me even go before your list. And let me just give you a simple definition of what evil or what sin is. Evil or sin is simply turning away your face from the Lord, from the one that made you, and turning to yourself in an effort to have what you want, to live just for yourself. You know what evil is? You know what sin is? It's turning within yourself. That's exactly the beginning of it in the Garden of Eden. Remember, we sang about them walking with God in the garden. But there came a day when they weren't walking with God anymore. They were hiding from God. And they were hiding from God because they turned away from him and they turned to themselves. They turned their faces away from God and consequently they turned to live just for themselves and do what they wanted to do regardless of who God was or what God said. But that doesn't change the fact that we have a good Lord. When people turn away from goodness, they turn away from God because goodness is summed up in him. Now let's talk about the good life. Americans like to talk about the good life. Human beings are looking for the good life. You know, all of these people that are coming across the border into our country, you know what they're really looking for? They're looking for the good life. Some people call it the American dream, the good life. Well, can I suggest to you that whatever your idea is of the good life, God is unwilling to be the means for you to experience what you call the good life, whatever definition you give to it. That's not what God's about. That's not what he's here for. Let's talk about, when, when we think about the good life, let's talk about expectation. Because the good life is about a hopeful life that we have imagined. And when we think about our expectations, let me ask you this question. Do you believe that God is performing on a level that is acceptable to you? But I mean, is God acting in a way that you think he should act in your life, in your experience? And if not... If you think that God is not acting and performing on the level that you think he should perform in your life, then is God out of line or is your viewpoint skewed? Is it off? These are questions that I think we need to ask ourselves. When we talk about the good life, and the expectations that people have, maybe we could boil it down to a list. Do you have a list of things that you would call that which makes up your definition of a good life? You know, there are many disillusioned people, even believers, because their life hasn't or doesn't match what they envisioned it should. They have their list of things. You may have your list of things that equals the good life. And whether you think about it or not, you try to make God into an ATM machine that you can go to and get those good things that you want. You get excited about what God can do of what God can give you 
to make your life good. You set your heart on a certain situation or certain things that will make you happy. And you, 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 you pray to get God to sign on to your list that equals the good life in your version. Well, when we talk about the good life and expectations, I want to turn attention from a list to a life. And by that, I mean, you have your list, but you know, God has his list too. And in Psalm 103 and verse 5, the psalmist says that one of the benefits that we should never forget is that God continually, he satisfies our mouth with good things. And I want to remind you that those good things that God satisfies his people with comes in a person. And that person is Jesus. Jesus is the good life. Jesus is the good life that every single person needs. And if you're a believer, you have the good life. You have Jesus. He's called life eternal. He is the good life. He is your life. The Bible says in Colossians 3 and verse 4, Christ is our life. And I'm telling you, he's the good life. So does your vision of the good life, so to speak, have God at the center of it? Or does it have you at the center of it? Does it have what God envisions as a good life or what you envision as a good life? You know, here's what I think the good life boils down to in many of our experiences. We want God to change our circumstances, or we want God to change another person that uh, we don't get along with or that uh, we don't like. So we want God to change our circumstances or to change others. But the only way that God can change other people or circumstances is through you. God changes you. And God changes you by living through you. And when God lives through you, he makes you more like him. And this is a very difficult process. For God to live through you, that means you have to die to yourself. And that is painful. For God to live through you, for you to, to experience the good life, which is Jesus, is him, he who is your life, and him living his life through you, you both can't live your life through you. One of you has to give up. Either Jesus lives his life through your life, or you live your life through your life, and you do what you want. So to live the true good life is a very painful process. The good life brought Jesus to that cross on Calvary, on Golgotha. And if you want to follow him, then there's a cross for you too. But that is what the good life is. That's what it's about. That's a proper expectation. If your expectation is, as a Christian, your problems dissolve, they go away, you live a, a happily ever after life here on this earth, you're fooling yourself. That's not a biblical expectation of the Christian life at all. In fact, the picture that Jesus paints is quite the opposite that there's suffering now, but there's a crown afterwards. There's glory that follows. That's, what our, that's why the hope that we have is such a blessed hope. Because it's not always happiness here. 
but it, there's joy nonetheless. So the good life, we have to talk about expectation when we talk about the good life because our expectations are skewed as human beings. There's a second thing that I want to mention under the heading of the good life, not only expectation, but rejection. You know, Jesus knew that he would be rejected when he came to this earth. And yet he never swerved from the path that the Father set before him. His was not an easy life. He suffered painful rejection by his own hometown that he grew up in from a little boy to a man. He even was rejected by his own brothers and sisters, his family members. Initially, it was very painful, the rejection. Because we have false expectations regarding this thing called the good life, it causes disappointment in Christian lives. Jesus lived a life that was perfect. He had ministry for the Father to people that was perfect, but he was still rejected. You know why? He was rejected because he didn't fit their idea of a Messiah. He didn't fulfill their dreams. Jesus faced rejection because he did not enable the people that he came to live the good life that they expected to live. And so because their expectations were false, they, re they rejected him. He faced rejection from them. Just like we do. When we don't get the good life that we think we should have as Christians, I'm doing all these things and doesn't work out the way we thought. We had false expectations. And so as a result, there then is this pushing away from the Lord and a rejection because we become disappointed by our false expectations because our dreams weren't fulfilled. You see, the people in Jesus' day that he came to, he came unto his own and his own received him not. Why? Well, because they wanted more signs and wonders. They didn't want a self-sacrificing, loving Savior. They wanted one that would, uh, would show his power that would outshine and would outdo the power of the Roman government that they were under the oppression of. They didn't, want, they didn't want a Messiah that was humble. They didn't want a Messiah that was holy. They wanted a Messiah that would crush Rome. They wanted a Messiah that would set them free. That was their thoughts of a good life. They wanted Jesus to change their circumstances, not them. And that's us. We want Jesus to change our circumstances. But we don't realize that in order for him to change our circumstances, he first of all has to change us. Jesus came to earth to change people and uh, to change people so that then people that he changed can change other people's circumstances for otherwise they would end eternity in hell. But he changes people so that we can change perishing people's circumstances. They had things all backwards, and so do we. Are you disappointed with God because he isn't performing the way that you expected him to in your life? Disappointment. Cause it it's, causes this rejection. But not only disappointment, but disillusionment. We have false expectations like they did. And false expectations leads people to walk away from God. You know what I'm convinced as I read the four Gospels? That Judas, Judas was looking for a Messiah that I just explained. A, a Messiah that would prosper Israel. A Messiah that would free Israel. 
Judas had false expectations regarding the Messiah. And I'm convinced the reason he betrayed the Lord is because the good life didn't happen that he had envisioned. He envisioned a total different Messiah that would bring in the golden age, that would bring in what we would call a millennium, the kingdom, the beauty that uh, the prophets promised. And as a result, he walked away from the Lord and betrayed him, put a knife in his back, so to speak. It reminds me of Job's wife. You know, we're impressed when we see all of that horror coming in such a, a, a torrent upon Job. And then Job, he falls down before the Lord and he worships the Lord. And he says, naked I came to this world. Naked shall I return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then in the next chapter, God allows Satan to, dis, to, to attack Job's body. And in verse 9 of chapter 2, his wife comes to him and she says, curse God and die. You don't have to go through. God's, he's, this isn't the good life. This isn't quality of life. Curse God and die. You know what Job says to her? To her? He says, you speak as a foolish woman. Shall we only expect good things from God and not ever have any bad things happen? That's what he says to her. You see, false expe expectations regarding the good life leads to disillusionment. And I, I want you to understand this. The Christian life and American life are totally opposite. When I talk about the Christian life, I'm talking about the Bible definition of the Christian life, not American Christianity's definition of it. But the Bible definition of the Christian life and American life are two absolute opposites. The good life, the American dream, that is the spiritual world turned upside down. It's a fantasy world with you at the center and you in control as the king, as the sovereign of your little world. You decide what's right. You decide what's good, what's important, what's invaluable. And you, you define what life is, and then you control the agenda and the timetable. That's American life. It's when you try to employ God to work for you, and when he does, you thank him, and you proclaim his goodness. But when it doesn't go your way, then you want to walk away from God, and you want to abandon God in disappointment and disillusionment. What's the solution for all of this? Well, in Psalm 73, we have the solution. I want you to see this. He says in uh, verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until, here's the turning point. Here's the solution to your problem tonight. If you're mixed up about the good life <laughs> and the goodness of God, is God good to you? You may not think he is. Well, how do you solve that dilemma? He says, I went into the sanctuary of God and I understood their end. You need to get in the presence of God. You need to get alone with God. You need to have a personal encounter with the living God. Simple as that. In fact, when you get to the end of this psalm, he says in verse 26, my flesh and my heart fails. But God's the strength of my heart. In fact, he's my portion forever. He says, those that walk away from God perish. Verse 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I put my trust in God. 
that I may declare all his works. Do you get it? Turn back to Psalm 62, and I'll close with this one. Psalm 62. This is a wonderful psalm. But here is the solution, folks. It's going to be reiterated here. Here's the solution. To any disappointment and disillusionment that has caused you to some degree enter into rejection of God because of false expectations regarding God. He says in verse 1, truly my soul waiteth, waiteth upon God. From him comes my deliverance, my rescue. Doesn't come from anywhere else. Doesn't come from the bank. Doesn't come from people. It comes from him. And then drop down to verse 5. He repeats it. My soul wait only, only upon God. For my expectation is from him. The word expectation means my hope. What are you hoping for? What are you hoping in? 23 times in the Old Testament, that word expectation is translated hope. My hope is from him. My expectation is the good things that you hope for are from him. And notice what he says. Here's how you get them. It's the result of waiting only upon God. To wait literally means to sit still and be silent. To sit still and be silent because you are trusting God. My soul. Wait only upon God, God for my rescue. My deliverance comes from him. Here's the solution to this problem of the good life that really ignores the good Lord. And it's simply this. Make your relationship with God your number one priority, and I'll guarantee you everything else will fall into place. Make your relationship with God your number one priority. Enter into that sanctuary. Draw near to God so that you can put your trust in him. You can't trust the God that you're not near because you don't know. So I close again with that question. Is God good? Now, I know he's good, but I, I mean how do you view him tonight? How do you view God? Do you view God as good? Are you disappointed with God or disillusioned with God because he didn't live up to your expectations? My soul wait only upon God for my expectation is not from me or anyone else, but from him. Who is your expectation from?